maybe we can do something a bit more justifiable, and that's where the causal perspective will help us out. So here's the same figure, and here notice that we, x is just one dimensional, but you could imagine that x is many dimensions, so here x is a vector, and with covariate shift we're essentially just predicting y from that vector. The covariate shift assumption will just tell us that the predictions of y given x in the training distribution, we're just going to transfer those over to the test distribution. Importantly, the structure of how x was generated and how y was generated is completely ignored here. The key insight that we'll use is to consider how these dimensions of the data were generated, how they relate to each other in the generative process. In other words, we're interested in the causal structure. So say that this is the causal graph. This means that, say, y was generated as a function of x4 and x5, x4 was generated as a function of x1, x5 was generated as a function of x2, and so on. Right? Any child was generated as a function of its parents in this graph. This is in contrast to when we were just considering x as a vector and y as a scalar. We weren't modeling their causal structure at all. We'll see that this causal structure is key. This has been a theme throughout this course, right? We saw it all the way back in the very first lecture in week one, and we've seen that it's key many times since then as well. Okay, so we'll first consider in-distribution prediction of y. This means that we have training data from p train of x comma y, and then our goal is to predict y in that exact same distribution. So given some unseen x from p train, we want to predict the corresponding y from p train. Out of sample means unseen in the sense that we train on the in sample data. We have some sample that we train on. We call that in sample. And then out of sample means any other data from that same distribution. Okay, so in this graph, y is the variable we're interested in predicting. And the question I have in mind is, what is the minimum set of variables that will give us optimal prediction? So we have all of these x nodes, and we could just use all of them to predict y. That will give us optimal prediction in the sense that it will give us all of the information about y that we have present in our data. But we don't actually need to use all of those. So the, this question is, which minimal set of nodes can we use that will encompass all of the information we have about y in our data? I encourage you to think about and try to answer this question yourself. So I'll give you a few seconds for that. Feel free to pause if you want to think for a while about it. Okay, so the key thing to think about is that we want to block all paths from any variable to y. That will mean that we've captured all of the mutual information between all the variables and y. Okay, so let's first consider the variables above y. So this x1, x2 x4, x7, x5, x8, all of these variables will have their path from to y be blocked if we condition on just x4 and x5. So we'll want to use those two variables in our conditioning set, in our set of variables that we'll use to predict y. Then we'll consider the variables below y, so that's x12, x13, x15, x16, and we can block those, ba those paths if we condition on x12 and x13, right, so that blocks the flow of association from x15 and x16 to y. But then when we condition on these variables, when we add these variables to our prediction set, we are conditioning on colliders, so that's going to open up these immoralities. So then there's information flowing from x3 to x9 to x12 to y. Similarly, this x11 has information flowing to y. Similarly, over here, we have the exact same thing happening. So in order to block that information, then we have to condition on x9 and x10, right? So we have to sort of add y's lovers to the conditioning set, to the variables that we will use for predicting y. Once we've conditioned on all these variables, we've blocked all paths from all the other variables to y. Okay, so none of these variables have information flowing to y because they're blocked by these variables around y. And this set of variables is known as the Markov blanket. The Markov blanket consists of the parents of a variable, the children of the variable, and then the sort of the lovers of the variable. I don't think lovers is a official term here. I think maybe I've heard the term spouse, but I don't think that's a super accurate term. Anyway, so if we predict y from all of these variables, then we'll get optimal prediction of y in the sense that 
we will predict y as well as we can from the data that we're provided from this set of x's. So when we're doing in distribution prediction of y, we want to use y's Markov blanket. However, when we're doing out of distribution prediction of y, when x comma y comes from some other distribution, p test rather than p train, then we're not going to want to use y's Markov blanket. So this is where the goal is instead to predict y from x sampled from p test, not from p train where our training data comes from. And then let's think about what we might know about the p test distribution. So this is where we're going to use the causal graph that we have here. We know that the data are generated in this way, and we know that we have two different distributions, p train and p test, and they're different distributions. So you can imagine that we're getting different distributions by doing different interventions on the nodes in this graph. Okay, so one distribution might be no interventions, another distribution might be intervening on x1, another could be intervening on multiple nodes, x13, x10, x6. It could be any set, any intervention that's on a set of variables could generate some distribution, p train or p test. And you could imagine that there's multiple different test distributions. Here we're just talking about one distribution, but if we're considering any distribution that's generated by an intervention on this graph, then there's a sort of combinatorial number of distributions that we could be considering. And why is it natural to model different distributions like p-test as distributions that arise from intervening on this graph, interventional distributions? Well, if you just imagine the world, data is being generated in some way, right? Things are happening that are causing other things to happen. If you just think of the world as being produced via a bunch of different mechanisms, so a mechanism, remember, for example, a mechanism for Y would be this right here, this graphical structure right here, because these are the parents of Y, those are the things that are generating y and the mechanism for y, or you can think of it as the structural equation for y. Anyway, if you think of the world as sort of sort of initial conditions and then a bunch of things being generated by different causal mechanisms, right, that's just kind of like sampling down this graph, then you might think of slightly different ways of generating data from this sort of mini world as where we just perturb each of these different ones. We just change them a little bit. Like, okay, we might change this mechanism that corresponds to an intervention on x13. And we'll consider any of these distributions except for the ones where we intervene on y, right? So we actually are going to need the mechanism that generates y to remain the same. So we won't consider distributions where y is intervened on. And the sort of key concept from a causality that we'll be using here is modularity. Recall that modularity means that when we intervene on a variable, that intervention only changes the causal mechanism or structural equation for that variable the variable that we intervened on. All other causal mechanisms remain unchanged. So graphically, this is the causal mechanism for y, and we can also represent it as this conditional distribution, or we could represent it as the structural equation for y, where we would have y on the left-hand side, and then x4 and x5 on the right-hand side. Anyway, so this conditional distribution, p of y given x4 comma x5, remains completely invariant. It doesn't change when we intervene on x2, when we intervene on x13, when we intervene on x13 and x15. If we do any of those interventions, it doesn't change this causal mechanism that generates y. But if we were to consider some non-causal conditional, so say we look at this conditional, p of y given x4, x5, and x12, which is not a parent of y, but it is a child of y, so it is x12 and y will be dependent. Because this conditional doesn't correspond to the structural equation for y, right? So the structural equation has x4 and x5 in it, but it doesn't have x12 in it. So this non-causal conditional doesn't correspond to that structural equation. Because of that, this conditional actually won't be invariant when we do interventions. So for example, if we look at the observational distribution where we don't do any intervention, this conditional will look a certain way, and then when we intervene on, say, x12, this conditional will change. It will be different than the conditional in the observational setting. Okay, so this is why modularity is key. Remember, we want to decide which variables we include in our set that we use to predict y from. 
And modularity is going to suggest to us that we want to only use the variables that are the causal parents of y. This is because we're interested in transfer, so we want to transfer from one distribution to another. When we're doing that, we want the conditionals to be invariant across those two distributions. We don't want those conditionals to change. And that will be true if we use the variables that are causal parents of y, because modularity tells us that that conditional, that causal conditional, will not change across any of those distributions, as long as we don't intervene on y. But if we were to consider other nodes that we would have in the Markov blanket, we would be interested in using those if we we're doing in-distribution prediction. So say x12, which we have in this non-causal conditional, this non-causal conditional will not be invariant across distributions. So for example, we could intervene on x12 in such a way that x12 and y are positively correlated conditional x4 and x5 in one distribution, in our train distribution, say. But then in our test distribution, because of how we've intervened on x12, x12 and y are negatively correlated conditional on x4 and x5. So that means that if we were to use x12 in the set that we use to predict y for learning some model that we want to transfer from our train to our test distribution, including x12 will actually hurt us. We'll perform worse on the test distribution than if we had not used it. So let's try to write this down with a bit of math. So basically the causal mechanism is optimal in this robust sense, whereby robust I mean when we take a maximum over all possible test distributions that we could be considering, which, remember, is any interventional distribution where we're only intervening on variables that are not y. We could intervene on any set of variables that is, does not include y. So if we have some loss, so we sample x, y from this test distribution, and then we have a loss where we're taking the expected value over those samples, of y given the prediction of y, where x here is the variables we've used to predict y, and here we have the squared loss. If we take the max over all test distributions, that's the robust loss. So we want to consider the worst case, the worst case distribution, and then we want to know what is the function that will give us the smallest loss, the smallest cost. And it turns out that that function is the conditional expectation of y given what? Given its causal parents. For example, you can see this paper from Rojas Carulla et al. 2018, where in their appendix, they give a proof for this. But generally, this is kind of a well-known result in the sense that we know that the causal mechanism is the only conditional, or the causal conditional that corresponds to the causal mechanism is the only conditional that will be invariant across all of the different interventional distributions. And just like as we mentioned in the covariate shift setting, this will still require that we have common support. So we're going to need that the support in the training distribution of the parents of y is the same as the support of the parents of y in the test distribution, where, remember, support just means the range of the random variables, the range that they can take on. Or if we can't make the common support assumption, we're going to have to make the assumption that we can extrapolate well from the support in the train distribution to the support in the test distribution, just like we discussed is the case in the covariate shift setting, and which you might remember from back in week two when we discussed positivity. So you can think of what we've just seen as a sort of relaxation of covariate shift. Here was the covariate shift assumption where x is this big vector of variables, we have that the conditional p train of y given x is equal to the conditional p test of y given x. Seems like kind of a strong assumption, and what we just saw, modularity, is a relaxation in the sense that we only need these two conditional distributions to be the same for a subset of x, specifically the causal parents of y. So that's the sense in which the modularity assumption is a relaxation of the covariate shift assumption. And that brings us to the end of the section on transfer learning and to these three questions. They're all about this graph. The first question is, what is the Markov blanket of y in this graph? Then what task is the Markov blanket good for? 
And finally, what input variables should we use for optimal robust prediction?